Hello, it's Scott Manley here. It's November 9th. It's time for another batch of Deep Space updates. And this is a huge one, frankly, because this has been uh, almost three weeks. Oh, forgive me, Father, for I have sinned. Uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's been a busy three weeks. So we're going to get through this. First of all, we're going to start out with the rocket launches. And as expected, we start out with another Starlink launch. Uh, 21 satellites launched from Vandenberg on the 21st of October. Uh, of course, going into the higher inclination orbits. 22nd of October, there was uh, another badge of Starlinks. 23 this time, Group 6-24, launching from Cape Canaveral. Uh, 23rd of October, a Long March 2D. And this is a, uh, it's a military satellite, uh, 3 Yogan uh, 39 uh, Earth Observation Reconnaissance Satellites going into low Earth orbit. But yeah, 26, this is an important one. This was Long March 2F slash G. That is the rocket which is used by China to launch their Shenzhou spacecraft. This was Shenzhou 17 carrying three new, new astronauts to the Chinese space station Tiangong. So the new crew is uh, Tang Hongbo, who previously flew on Shenzhou 12, and uh, Tang Shenji and Jiang Jinlin, who are two new uh, astronauts who have never flown. So good, uh, good job, huh? Now, this of course means that Shenzhou 16 got to return to Earth. And I did make a little video about that because when it landed, oh, it looked like a pretty rough landing. It came down with a bit too much horizontal speed and very visibly rolled a couple of times. Obviously, uh, we don't know anything if there was any injuries. They certainly made it put a good face on it. We saw the crew saluting, but you know, uh, it was probably not pretty. They probably get bruised, but yeah, they're alive. That's what really matters. 27th of October, there was a Soyuz 2.1B. That is the launch vehicle, not the, the, um, not the upper stage. Uh, this was carrying a pair of satellites, Cosmos 2570 and 2571. We believe that one of these is a LOTOS, uh, um, electronic intelligence satellite. This was into low Earth orbit. And uh, the LOTOS, there was another one, the 2571. We don't know exactly what that was, but it was released a few days later, uh, which is interesting. 29th of October, yeah, it's another Falcon 9. Uh, this was Starlink Group uh, 7-6 from Vandenberg. 22 satellites this time, so they're managing to yeah, bump that number a bit. 30th October, Falcon 9 again, Starlink 23 satellites from uh, group Starlink Group 6-225 out of Cape Canaveral. This launch was notable for two reasons. First of all, according to SpaceX, it was supposed to be their 200th booster reuse, not including Falcon Heavy cores, whatever that means. But um, also, it was a scrub than the first time they tried to launch. They got down to about 30 seconds and then they had to call it off due to a hold. Uh, the problem appears to be something related to pressure inside the pusher that separates the first and second stages. There is a big like uh, pressurized uh, pusher thing that sticks up against the engine on the second stage and that pushes the vehicles apart. Uh, I'm not sure if this was a gauge, a pressure reading that was wrong or it was an actual part failure, but whatever happened, they launched the next day successfully. And the 31st of October was a Chinese launch vehicle, a Long March 6A. We don't have many of those, but this is the one which isn't full of horrible toxic propellant, but it does use solid rocket engines. And, well, as part of this, well, so the launch vehicle was carrying a pair of satellites called Tianhui uh, 5A and 5B into low incline, or sorry, into low orbit, sun synchronous orbit. A pair of Earth observation satellites for the Chinese Academy of Space, I don't know. Uh, but one of the things I saw on the internet was some fan, uh, you know, Chinese spaceflight fan, who got some absolutely amazing footage showing the uh, boosters getting separated off of this. This is the first Chinese launch vehicle to actually use solid uh, rocket motors on the side. Uh, these were also found out on in the ground later. It's also uh, cryogenic propellant, kerosene, liquid oxygen, all that stuff. So it's very much breaking the mold. Um, but anyway, yes, 3rd of November, Long March 7A. Uh, this was carrying uh, the TJS-10 satellite into geostationary orbit. This is a technology demonstrator satellite, I think, for 
Chinese military, possibly. At 4th of November, we had a Falcon 9. But this Falcon 9 was the NASA booster again, the one with the NASA worm logo on the side that launched demo, whatever, you know, long, long time ago. That meant that this booster now flew on its 18th flight, making it a leader carried uh, 23 Starlink satellites from Cape Canaveral and has been recovered successfully. So it gets to go again and push out that number a little more. 8th of November, there was a Falcon 9. Again, another batch of 23 Starlink satellites from uh, Cape Canaveral. 9th of November, Long March uh, 3B slash E from Chi Chang. Uh, so this Satellite uh, is a geostationary satellite. It's launching a ChinaSat 6E to replace an earlier ChinaSat 6B. And finally, just a few hours ago, we had CRS-29 launching from the Cape, carrying another batch of cargo to the International Space Station. So anyway, in addition to the orbital launches, there are three pretty important suborbital launches I want to talk about. First of all, there was the India Space Research Organization performing an in-flight abort test of their Gaganyan uh, crew capsule. Now, this was a one-off launch vehicle with a, the capsule attached on top. So, uh, yeah, this was set up. They began the countdown. They got to five seconds and then they had an abort. And most people just tuned out at that point. But if they'd stuck around for another hour and 15 minutes, they actually got it all the way through the countdown. It launched and carried that spacecraft upwards. And about 60 seconds into the flight near max Q, they triggered the abort sequence. The escape tower pulled the fairing and the capsule away from the spacecraft. The grid fins deployed to keep it stable. Then the capsule pops out. It deploys a drogue chute, then a regular chute, and then it landed gently in the water and was recovered. Successful test, paving the way for perhaps humans to be flying on this spacecraft at some point in the future, presumably with a larger rocket. Uh, another flight which did have humans on board was Virgin Galactic 5, which carried, again, three more paying passengers, although two of those passengers were paid for by uh, NASA. Kelly Girardi, your space ambassador, scientist, that kind of thing. And Alan Stern, who of course was principal investigator for New Horizons. He got to fly a suborbital flight and he got to do some experiments on it and hopefully enjoyed himself. And I'll be honest, I don't remember the name of the third person because they were publicizing it. The other suborbital launch isn't really a space launch. It was an ICBM test, which is they do these regularly to show that the US fleet of ballistic missiles is ready to fire at a moment's notice and destroy any enemy that should attack the US. Well, they fired this off just after midnight and first stage worked, second stage worked, third stage went off course and they had to destroy it. So that is a test failure. We're probably getting another one, but they have to make sure that these things are good to go. So uh, yeah, they, they do these tests regularly. Anyway, out in deep space, the Lucy spacecraft made its first encounter with an asteroid. So this is, of course, on the way to the Trojans, you know, leading and uh, lagging behind Jupiter. But this one was in the main belt, an asteroid which got the name Dinganesh, which is, of course, part of the Lucy, the hominid skeleton was found, I believe, it, Dinkanesh is the place nearby. So this small asteroid, it looked to be about, you know, what, was 600 meters across or something like that. And uh, did the fly past, we got a set of images back and it was a big surprise because it looked like there was a moon around it. A uh, moon maybe, you know, 200 meters across. So that is very cool. Now, I think I figured out the orbit was about 2.3 kilometers based on the period of the light curve. And that was all very cool because that brought the number of encounters that uh, Lucy was going to have up to 11. And then a few days later, they got more data down and we found out that the moon was actually made of two smaller moons. Now, this was a contact binary and I'm presuming that it's going to be tidally locked to the parent and keeping this orientation. But these two things, they haven't merged, right? They're not a rubble pile that has just coalesced into a single thing. These are two objects which very clearly are still separate, even though they are touching. So that is a huge, this is the first contact binary moon that we have seen in the solar system. 
very cool discovery. Back closer to home, if you remember Varda Space, earlier in the year they launched a payload to uh, basically perform drug manufacture in space in the hope that they would come back to Earth. Well, they haven't been able to get it to come back to Earth because they haven't been able to sort out their licensing with the, the FAA and the other uh, interested parties on the Earth. And uh, in the last few weeks, they actually signed an agreement with Australia which will permit them to land payloads on in Australia instead, and maybe that will circumvent this these problems for future flights. Albeit they won't be able to do it for this flight for you know various technical exchange reasons. So there is a sort of bigger story as well where the U.S. State Department has now got memorandum of understanding and contract treaty, whatever is necessary to basically allow US rocket builders to launch their rockets on Australian ranges. This includes like a legal framework to make sure there's no accidental technology transfer and all that. Um, but yeah, we might see some US launchers flying from the Southern Hemisphere, other than Rocket Lab, obviously, who already fly from New Zealand. A United Launch Alliance, if you remember, they have been trying to get their Vulcan test flight going and now we have a new date, it's gonna be December 24th. Yes, yeah, so Christmas Eve, they're hoping to fly the first launch of Vulcan. That will be a great Christmas present if it actually goes off. Um, they've obviously had issues this year. They were ready to go and then they found a problem with the Centaur V, Centaur 5 upper stage, which necessitated some strengthening of the hardware redesign testing. And it's currently on a barge on the rocket ship sailing to Florida for integration. This will, of course, carry a space probe to the moon. And that is why it has to fly on Christmas Eve, because they need to line up their launch window with the possibilities of getting to the moon. Um, elsewhere, um, so yeah, China, they are announcing a program where they are allowing um, private companies to perform crew tra or sorry cargo transfer to the China space station, Tiangong. So we might see some of the you know, independent-ish companies in China developing some kind of spacecraft that can transfer cargo, very much in the same way that SpaceX stood up Dragon to do this thing. ABL Space Systems, if you remember, they had a launch of, of the RS-1 earlier this year. It was a failure. Well, they published a nice big long Substack article explaining what happened and uh, what the conclusions were. After the analysis, they've determined that there was a fire in the engine bay, which very quickly led to a power cable burning through. And as soon as that power cable burned through, the fuel valves closed. Uh, that was a safety measure, so the thing wasn't flying out of control, um, which meant that the rocket then fell back on the pad and caused a big explosion. Now, so the cause of the fire they believe that it is because the flame diverter they were using was not sufficient for the task and there was uh, exhaust flow recirculation which overcame the heat shield, managed to penetrate inside the aft area and start that fire. So there is a new flame diverter for the next launch and they've been testing this out on on a, like a pier in Long Beach and presumably they will be taking it up to Kodiak to perform an actual test uh, at some point. I'm guessing at this point will be next year, but yeah, uh, maybe, maybe sooner. ABL, of course, is also lined up to launch from the Saxavord space port in Scotland, you know, in the Shetland Islands. Um, that's still very much on the back burner, but interestingly, there was also a story that the US, uh, sorry, the UK government has uh, given some money to uh, our rocket factory, Ellsberg, to test their rocket uh, there. So there's some money that's coming potentially to help that get off the ground. Um, Blue Origin, they had a big press event and they showed off the new Blue Moon. So this is the precursor to their big human lander. This is going to carry your cargo to the surface as part of the commercial lunar payload system. If you remember, they previously had a Blue Moon event, which included like a cool little uh, elevator system to get payloads off the top of the lander onto the lunar surface. It also included large spherical propellant tanks, which of course meant everyone said, you know, Blue Origin, Blue Moon has blue balls. This one doesn't have that anymore, but it still is using hydrogen and oxygen propellant with a BE-7 engine. 
it's just a, a mock-up, but I'm hoping that this means they progress a little further with their plan because there's a lot of people that will be needing that kind of capability. Um, National Security Space Launch Phase 2 allocated another 11, oh, another 21 launches. So this is US Government Department of Defense has a bunch of missions that they need to launch. 11 of those have been allocated to the United Launch Alliance. 10 of them are going to SpaceX for a Falcon 9 or a Falcon Heavy. Um, there's a lot of details on these which uh, are completely escaping my mind. But uh, there is actually one interesting Department of Defense mission which we expect to go in coming weeks. And that is um, SpaceX Falcon Heavy launching the X-57B. If you remember this little space plane that the US Air Force puts up, they do a bunch of experiments in space and then it flies back to the Earth. Now, this is previously launched on the Atlas V. It's launched on the Falcon 9. But this time they're launching on the Falcon Heavy. That is a whole bunch more capability than you previously expected. So um, what we think is going on here is they're going to launch it into a higher orbit. The original um, like proposal, the original contract called for putting a, like a six and a half ton vehicle into geostationary transfer orbit. And they might do that they would need some extra delta V to be able to get back to the Earth. And then there's also the problem that a spacecraft falling back from geostationary orbit is going to be going a lot faster. And the heat shield is not an ablative heat shield like we see on SpaceX. It is a tile-based heat shield closer to what's on the space shuttle. So I'm guessing that they are going to be boosting this into a more eccentric orbit. They're possibly going to spend just time flying in and out of the Van Allen belts for testing things. But I think they will be coming back with a bit more energy than previously. Or maybe they will slow the thing down into a circular orbit before landing. Either way, this is going to be an interesting to watch because, of course, they're going to cut off the connection straight afterwards and we're not going to know what orbit it goes into until some amateur finds out where it is. Nevertheless, definitely very, uh, very cool thing to be watching. Okay, also in the space plane business, uh, Sierra Nevada, Sierra Space Systems, the dream chaser is has been complete. It has been fully integrated. All the hardware is on. It is now going to go for testing. Yeah, Tenacity is being shipped to the Neil Armstrong like flight test center. It's going to be put in vacuum chambers and you know, thermal test chambers and verified that it works and currently they're talk they're thinking that if all goes well which it probably doesn't but if all goes perfectly they could well be launching this to the international space station in march of next year that will fly on a vulcan and hopefully it will begin an entirely new supply and return capability on the space station so we currently have cygnus and dragon 2 and Cygnus, of course, has more space, but it burns up and can't bring stuff back, so it's great for dumping trash. Dragon 2 is fine for getting stuff back, but the advantage that Dream Chaser will offer is the ability to bring things back with lower G-loading and bring it back to a runway where it can be very quickly offloaded as opposed to landing in the middle of the water and then having a slow water-based recovery. So that's definitely cool. Um, Rocket Lab. So Rocket Lab had their like um, you know Q3, Q4 earnings, but as part of that, they also announced the uh, details of the failure which they had earlier this year, where there was a problem with the second stage engine, and it confirmed what I and many other people had suspected that there was some sort of highly energetic electrical arcing on those big batteries which caused a failure of the power system and a failure of the engines. So, I mean, the details they have there basically is that there was some minor, you know, undetectable problem with the insulation on the cabling. There was, uh, you know, not enough gas pressure on it to suppress the arcs. And all the, the various problems put together to conspire to make this arc happen. Going forward, it sounds like that one of the first solutions they're going to uh, you know, use is they're going to pressurize important parts of the power system to try and uh, stop arcing from happening. 
Um, but yeah, they're going to get back to flight very soon. There's a Japanese payload. And if you if we believe the, you know, the third quarter or sorry, the financial results that they announced, they have 22 launches next year, including like their suborbital hypersonic test stuff, which is going to uh, I think there's another one coming very soon for like a 3D printed Australian space plane called Transonics with an X. Um, Virgin Galactic, they also talked about their earnings and yeah, big changes there. First of all, they're laying off a bunch of people in California. They are going to continue flying the Unity space plane with a monthly cadence till about the middle of next year and then stop. And then they're going to continue working on Delta. So Delta is the next generation version of the Unity you know, Spaceship 2. Something that's designed to be able to re get refurbished and reflown with significantly higher cadence. Uh, we don't know exactly what changes are being made to make this possible, but Virgin Galactic are in a situation where they need to have you know bump up their flight cadence because there's actually a competitor in the market and the, if they can launch faster they can make that money faster um, so yeah that is uh, what's going on with them and then <laughs> and the other person the other company that came along with financial news was Astra right at the end of October they had to put out a statement saying they defaulted on one of their loans uh, so that's problematic and they were supposed to give quarterly earnings that mysteriously got cancelled and now there's stories that the founders are trying to buy the company back and take it private for about 30 million dollars which boy yeah I'm glad I didn't invest in Astra because they were looking at valuations they were talking about valuations of two billion dollars and now they're talking about valuations of tens of millions of dollars. Rocket 4, I'm not sure we're going to see it fly at this point, which is a real shame. But they still have their spaceship engine business, which is, of course, you know, designed for satellite service. But that isn't necessarily enough to hang a $2 billion company off of. Yeah, so we're not sure whether when we're going to see any more launches out of Astra. We're not sure if the company is going to survive or whether it's going to get taken private or not. But anyway, all that is to say, the real story is this morning I woke up and somebody posted a picture of four people walking around Boca Chica. Okay, so what? They had backpacks. They had big you know, cases on their back. And they were the explosives team. They are now working on the flight termination system for Starship and Super Heavy. And that indicates to many people that they are getting very close to going. Now, there were rumors that the license had been published, had been accepted. There is no evidence of that at this time. But they are making finishing touches to a rocket with flight capable, you know, uh, flight abort hardware, which is hopefully uh, get a little more kick in it after the last time so that they can actually take the rocket out of the equation should it go off course this time. Another clue that the launch of Integrated Flight Test 2 may be upon us is the fact that uh, we have seen a Bronco OV-10 patrolling the airspace around uh, the, the launch site. And this previously happened in April for the first flight test. So the fact that this same plane is back doing the same thing is a pretty strong sign that something is about to happen. Yeah, I'm thinking that sometime next week we may well see a launch, but it is by no means confirmed at this point. It could slip further and yeah, lots of questions to be asked. So your vehicle is stacked. Again, it's been unstacked, restacked, tested. At some point, it's going to fly, and I think it's going to fly sooner rather than later. So that's going to be the big news very soon. We're very much looking forward to that, and I can't wait to see what happens and see what kind of, um, well, expletives come out of my mouth involuntarily when this thing actually takes off. <laughs> it's going to be exciting. Excitement guaranteed. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.